Hallo und herzlich willkommen heute Abend hier in München im Internationalen Begegnungszentrum. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir die Möglichkeit haben, mit unseren internationalen Gästen aus Bosnien-Herzegowina und Serbien die neueste Ausgabe der Perspectives Südosteuropa vorzustellen. Und damit es für unsere äh, internationalen Gäste interessanter ist, spreche ich mal gleich auf Englisch weiter. Ja. So, hello and welcome here tonight in Munich. My name is Katja Giebel for the Heinrich Böll Foundation Berlin. Um, I'm working in the East and Southeastern Europe division and dealing, I'm dealing with Western Balkans. And yeah, that's what I'm, why I'm very glad we are able to present uh, the Perspective Südosteuropa magazine today with guests, authors, and also colleagues from the region. Um, the title of this new Ish magazine is uh, The Past is Now and Politics of Denial and Dealing with the Past in the Western Balkans. And not only our panel guests, but also myself um, and the Heinrich Böll Foundation is today um, as guests here. Um, and it's not by chance that we are in Munich today. Um, already when the publication was still in the making, we thought it would be a very good idea to present it in Munich together with the South Eastern Europe Association and also with our colleagues from the Petra Kelly Foundation, which is the Bavarian um, Foundation of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and also we cooperated under the umbrella of the Balkan Days. Because for the topic of dealing with the past, Uh, and with the recent past and with the experiences and consequences of the 1990s wars, we had several important target groups in mind. Um, so first uh, of all, we wanted to reach out to the academic audience and to policy representatives and also the discussion with the, the diaspora is very important. Uh, and that's why we are today here in Munich and tomorrow we are going to launch the, uh, the, uh, the issue again in Berlin. Um, the journal Perspective Southeastern Europe is published jointly by our offices of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Sarajevo and Belgrade. And for this issue, they have invited with the editor uh, Milos Cirich, 20 authors and relevant voices to reflect on what has been and achieved in the past decades in the field, field of documentation, commemoration, and reappraisal of the his recent history. And among the authors, there are many critical voices. Some of them even come to the con conclusion that it is not possible at all to deal with the past in the Western Balkans because it is not yet. Um, three of the authors are with us today. They come Selma Korjenic, Sarjan Milosevic, and Dragan Markovina with us online. And Dr. Jacqueline Niese from the University of Regensburg will lead the discussion. Thank you all for your willingness and interest. I'm very great to have you here. And also thank you very much to our partner organizations here in Munich for your interest and support um, and your great help to make this possible here on this site. And with this, I'm going to hand over already to Victoria. Victoria Kogesinger Palm, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the South East Europe Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katja. Um, a warm welcome also from my side. I have already been introduced, so no need to do that again. Um, dealing with the past, the topic of today's event is a crucial topic for the Balkans. The Balkan region has suffered from wars and atrocities in its very recent past. Basically, if you think about it, every person from the Balkans who is older than 30 is in some way a contemporary witness of the wars in the 1990s. And I think it is very hard to imagine, especially for people here in Germany, where the concept of war or the remembrance of war is something that is growing rather distant to us. We read about it in books. Maybe our grandparents have told us about it, but it's not that present to us here. And I think this is why it's very hard to imagine for us now what this very recent memory of violence and war can do or actually does to our society. 
And with nationalistic rhetoric rising again, not just in the Balkans, uh, but all over Europe, the process of dealing with the past is more important than ever for a peaceful coexistence. And for the Southeast Europe Association, as an organization that is working to improve knowledge on and relations with the Southeast European states, including the Balkans, the process of dealing with the past in the region is very important also to us as an organization, which is why we have dedicated numerous conferences, workshops, discussions, and also publications on this topic, which you can also find a few in the back at the book table. And this is why I'm also very interested in today's discussion and the publication that is being presented to hear the insights from the experts from the region on what is the current state of remembrance and dealing with the past in the region and actually what can be done to improve also the situation. Um, and I don't want to keep you any longer from, from the interesting insights from our experts. And, I also, and so I only want to thank our colleagues from the Heinrich Böll Foundation, actually, for the initiative to jointly organize this event here in Munich and for coming to Munich. And also, um, thank you to the entire team of organizers, the partners from the Peter Kelly Stiftung, from the Balkan Tage, and also, of course, also to our team um, for, the, for the organizational work. Thank you very much. Just very, very few words also on my part. I'm Tarama Romano from the Petra Kelly Foundation. We are the regional seats of the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, here in Bavaria. Uh, and we are very glad to be part of the organization of this event uh, tonight, uh, also because uh, the West Balkans are like one of our hard topic when we uh, talk about international and European politics. And so, yeah, enjoy the discussion. Um, um, get as many copies of the publication <laughs> to spread around. Uh, and uh, um, I, I don't know if it was mentioned already, but uh, we are making also a, um, a video registration of the, of the event. So you can also uh, spread it afterwards um, uh, for people that weren't able to come here tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, welcome from my side as well to this book presentation and discussion organized by many, uh, but on the, uh, um, under the guidance of the Bill Foundation. Um, tonight we have come together under the headline, The Past is Now, Politics of Denial and Dealing with the Past in the Western Balkans. It's the title of a magazine called Perspectives Southeastern Europe, which will uh, be the last issue, as I understood, um, under this name by the Bull uh, Foundation. The foundation has, as already mentioned, invited 20 authors, experts on uh, memory politics to take stock of the current situation of memory politics in, post in the post yugoslav space. From my research at the University of Regensburg, um, on a transnational uh, network of memory activists called RECOM. I know many of these authors, and that's why I'm particularly delighted to um, moderate the discussion today. Before I introduce the three authors who will present their uh, text uh, uh, tonight, I will shortly refer to the introduction of the issue which was written by Nino Leava, who is present with us, a lady in red, um, <laughs> and as well. Um, she is head of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's office, uh, Belgrade office. And uh, she explains that the texts discuss what was achieved over the past decades in the fields of documentation, memorialization, and processing of the recent history in the post-Yugoslav societies. I sum up the questions. Which actors and factors determine the cultural context of dealing with the past? Who could actually deconstruct the hate narratives prevailing in the public sphere? How was nationalism affecting the culture of remembrance in the respective societies? And one question which I find particularly interesting is why didn't the brutal experience lead to a better understanding of the common history in the region? I find this question interesting because I would say the brutal experience are actually hindering a better understanding of the common history in the region, but the question is framed otherwise. Um, 
Liyava also notes that not only local, but also external actors are critically assessed in that issue. That means um, texts are written on what Western don donors were able to achieve or not achieve. So where did help helpers to dealing with the past fail in the region as well, which is an interesting question. And finally, why has dealing with the past never become mainstream, she asks, despite the efforts of many brave, consistent, and professional individuals. Actually, those brave, consistent, and professional individuals have contributed mainly to this issue of perspective Southeastern Europe. I'm delighted now to hear three of the authors presenting their texts, and we will do it in the following way. Uh, I suggest to first hear the presentations, one after another, without questions. Then uh, I will have a closed round of discussion, asking questions to the panelists. And after that, we will plenty have we will have plenty of time, about forty five minutes, to discuss with you as well in the audience. We will start with Selma Korjenic, who is the head of program in Bosnia and Herzegovina of the NGO Trial International Sarajevo. Uh, the word trial stands for track impunity always um, and supports victims in court proceedings, but also monitors the implementation of laws related to war crimes and reparations in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I could uh, attend or observe many of their or some of their meetings when I was living in Sarajevo in 2011 and 12, and they are really dig uh, doing a, a, a huge and important work there. Emma is a sociologist, sociologist by profession, by profession, and has written the article together with Aina Mamic, who is legal advisor at Trial International. Please, say. Thank you very much. And I would like, first of all, to use opportunity for all of you and to thank you for coming and for showing the interest in the topics of the dealing with the past related to the Western Balkan. I believe that this is a good occasion and I'm very encouraged actually that we uh, change the approach instead of coming to Bosnia and talking about the things we are now also going outside of Bosnia and talking with the people who are I mean, based here, but originally are maybe from Western Balkans. Anyway, as, as our dear moderator said, my name is Selma Korinic and I'm head of Trial International Program in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we are present since 2007 with the aim, first of all, to help survivors of war uh, to improve their rights on justice and reparations and redress. But more broadly, we are really working on uh, many aspects of the dealing with the past. But I will now get back on the topic of my contribution and my colleague's contribution to, to this really important magazine that I sincerely hope will also find some translation in Bosnia and Serbian creation, because it's also important that the many, many actors in Bosnia also reads, reads these great articles. Uh, we actually decided to write about one of the main topics, which is, <laughs> to be honest, a uh, daily topic in Bosnia and Herzegovina related to the uh, neglection of the committed war, uh, war, cri uh, war crimes in Bosnia, glorification of the convicted war criminals. So basically, we have been living there. But what was the what was the main the reason we were uh, we are the organization one of the organizations that several years ago really recognized the trend of you know the the the, the increasing trend of the you know these these uh, issues in the public and we recognized even because we have been working on the uh, uh, prosecution and helping the prosecutors to 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 work on the cases to prosecute many of the perpetrators we really recognize that the criminal justice as a such who gave a response in the past years, you know, to the many prosecutions before the ICTY, but also before the national courts, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, cannot give the answers on what the citizens and society wants, which is the reconciliation or dealing with the past. So basically, I mean, uh, the trend of dividing toward the ethical rhetorics in the in the society, and the fact actually that we are not celebrating and remembering 
all the victims jointly together than we are them separating on many, many ways. And at the same time, this, this, increased, uh, 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 this increased way of glorification actually brought us to the fact that we need to do something. Uh, I'm saying this because it doesn't mean that uh, uh, in previous years, people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also some other politicians didn't try to do anything. In, in the past, we had a couple of attempts by the officials, I would say, or at some point, the MPs who were sitting in the BIH parliament to introduce uh, either the laws who will specifically treat the glorification uh, denying and all this related to the recent war, but also uh, related to the Holocaust, but also to, to amend the criminal code of the Bosnian Herzegovina. All these attempts uh, since not, uh, 2009 and 2019 failed. Why they, why they failed? Because of the fact that they couldn't get the majority of the votes in the BIH parliament. You probably know how the BIH parliament is uh, actually established and what is the way of the voting. So basically, more or less all the state's attempts uh, to adopt something through the legislative were failing. First of all, because of you know, lack of the votes and the support from Republika Srpska, but also we had an attempt at the level of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina where also experienced uh, the lack of political will for, for many actors. So basically, uh, the institutional way of the recognition, what is happening was not possible, obviously. And at the same time, this growing trend of the hate speech, I mean, you probably saw through the media what was happening and what is still happening, uh, you know, the murals of, of convicted war criminals, celebrations on every, I don't know, uh, commemoration. I mean, different social media messages created by different groups and the people. So it really, I mean, uh, negatively influenced already fragile <laughs> society, but especially uh, people who is coming from the, from the community of the victims. And that was the reason why we wanted really to push uh, for something. First of all, we, we try through the international community to push them and recall, uh, telling them that they need to send a stronger message to the Bosnian Herzegovinian authorities, uh, especially in the, in the process of the BIH accession. But I, my, my opinion actually is that uh, those messages that were sent were really soft and uh, not, not direct to our authorities. So basically, uh, we continued jointly with the victims associations and some other civil society organizations to, to put the pressure, especially in the public space. And <laughs> how to say, fortunately or unfortunately, at the end of his mandate, uh, the former high representative of, of the uh, uh, high representative, uh, uh, Valentin Insko, uh, actually uh, decided to put <coughs> actually to impose the, the, the amendments to the criminal code of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, changing, actually adding this article 145 uh, uh, related, uh, completely related to the uh, glorification, denial, uh, uh, neglection of the established court facts, first of all. What I could say uh, through the analyzing that this article specifically, uh, that the article was written really uh, in a way and in a manner that all the actual European uh, uh, standards are, are, are followed. And the, the, the article is written in the way actually that take in consideration all the crimes, not just the genocide. Like, for example, it is perceived in the media that the, the current criminal code is actually not uh, imposing the ban on, on uh, neglecting on, uh, and, and uh, uh, neglecting the, the genocide, but also all other war crimes. What happened? I mean, it, ha uh, it, it was in, uh, in August 2020, as far as I remember, and it's almost, yeah, it's in 21, sorry, uh, and it's almost two years. What happened as a first reaction was actually, I mean, uh, 
from the positive aspect, uh, a lot of praise uh, coming from the, I would say, more pro-Bosniak side, Bosniak Muslim side, especially victims associations, but on the other side, really, really negative answer as it was expected from the Republika Srpska, especially Republika Srpska authorities, who as the reaction of imposition of the criminal code uh, changes, withdraw from the institutions of the Bosnia and Herzegovina and completely, you know, break the work of the institutions. I cannot say that the previous the institutions were working well, but that was the first reaction. And it was expected reaction. But what happened? I mean, I, I will try to be as much as short uh, in a way. Okay, we have uh, almost two years of the of the of the imposition of the the amendments on the criminal code. We have now uh, authorities from Republika Srpska get back to the institutions. They, they, they are part now of the new coalitions and they are continuing the work. So basically. Uh, my message is actually, I'm not uh, saying that this was the right path, but when you see that the things, the basic things that I would like to call in international, how to say so-called international language, uh, red lines shouldn't be crossed. This is like really an example, you know, why we unfortunately in Bosnia and Herzegovina need those red lines. The second question, is actually what we wanted to tackle with the article, what now when we have changed the criminal code of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, what will happen? What is happening? As the first reaction in 21, uh, especially in the second half of 21, we really uh, saw some kind of, let's say, decreasing trend of the, you know, the hate speech and the glorification and denial. But uh, due to the fact that the criminal code somebody needs to, I mean, implement, and due to the fact that based on uh, so far already uh, 40 criminal charges against different persons from the public and politician, but also individuals who, let's say, uh, had some kind of uh, ways of uh, articulating the hate speech related to the criminal code amendments haven't been prosecuted yet. The question is actually, you know, what are the answers? And this is what exactly we wanted to tackle with this article. Whether really uh, these uh, changes in the law are not applicable, are not, I mean, practically implemented, or uh, whether there is something around that. Uh, due to this, how to say, the, the, the un, unresolved situation, in May, recently, a few weeks ago, we organized the first round table in Sarajevo with the uh, chief prosecutor office, actually with the state prosecutor office of the Bosnia and Herzegovina to discuss, I mean, what's going on? Okay, one minute. What's going on? So basically, the conclusion of the event was uh, that the experts, legal experts, confirmed that there are no any kind of issues with the implementation from the legal side. There is only a lack of willingness and the capacities to put everything in a charge. So I will finish now here because we I, I don't have a lot of time to continue discussion, but. I mean, my message is actually, I mean, that uh, if we uh, have, it's not enough to have uh, the law adopted if the law is not implemented. So basically this means that uh, the answers are all around us. Uh, even if we have the law implemented in a way that we have the first cases prosecuted, this will be not enough, you know, to, uh, to, to continue working on the topic. It will be very important, as I said in the article, but I believe that my other colleagues will tackle that some other aspects of the work of the dealing with the past uh, uh, from the civil society, but also from the, I will say more institutional level are functioning in order that we can really tackle this issue. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Selma Koyanic from Bosnia, and with quite good news, I would say, uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Not good, 
I'm not sure if I said something positive. <laughs> it depends on the perspective. Um, second, um, our second speaker will be online. Um, I welcome Dagan Markovina, who is a historian, a publicist, and columnist. Markovina is the author of many books on memory culture, unfortunately, only in Serbo Croatian language mostly. And Markovina is also uh, a leftist and by that an oppositional figure in, uh, in Croatia and a well known person in the public sphere. He originate, originates from Mostar in Bosnia and Herzegovina and is living in Split in Croatia, if I'm not uh, wrong. Please. Uh, hello to, to everybody. I'm sorry that uh, you must hear, uh, look at me and hear on Zoom and not on, not uh, live. I will try to explain uh, the, my basic idea uh, of my text and, uh, and everything, what I think uh, about those idea of the project, uh, of the collective project of the reconciliation and uh, dealing with the memory and, and something like that. I think that uh, the idea of uh, culturing of memory and dealing with the past on the way uh, on the way that we used to work it last 20 years or 25, 27 years after the war collapsed. I think that this uh, uh, that the people who are who are doing that kind of job as you are, must find some other way, other ways to to re, to reach uh, the public sphere and the population in general. Now, what happened? What is happening uh, since the end of the war till today? Is the same. Is the same thing. Uh, the people who who are anyhow who who knows mainly what happened in war. Uh, who knows who who made the war crimes? Who knows uh, which politics are are uh, responsible for for war crimes, for nationalistic idea, for the for everything bad with ha what happened in the in the post Yugoslavia or, or in ex Yugoslavia, call it whatever you want, uh, are talking together about those facts. So uh, I don't think that there, there is any more point that few of us or I don't know few, few percent of the population who thinks uh, mostly the same about the, the consequences of war and the, the, the and that what's happening uh, that there is no point that we uh, talk to each other and that they say oh you are right you said something you something very good and and we don't have any kind of connection with the with the public sphere main mainstream public sphere and nothing uh, actually changed in the in the societies uh, which had the experience of the war. Uh, everything what Selma uh, was uh, speaking before me, we all know. Uh, you know the. I don't think that uh, any anyone who is uh, older than I don't know thirty years, as the as we hear here at the beginning of this session. Uh, doesn't know actually what happened uh, in generally in the Yugoslavian wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia and uh, I don't know in Kosovo and something like that. Everyone uh, mostly knows what know what happened, uh, but the problem is that the lot of the population of the nation, our nationalistic population, lot of the people are satisfied with, with uh, those crimes which happened they they don't want to say it loudly but they are and they don't have any kind of problem with that so when you uh, are working on the ngos or you are working on the some kind of alternative uh, liberal left uh, and not nationalistic politics uh, on those questions uh, they are they are they made a perfect uh, perfect uh, idea of how they will elim eliminate you from the public sphere. Uh, they all say to people like us here in this table, you are the enemy of your, of your nation because you are speaking about the war crimes of your nations, of your nations. So you, you hate your own nation 
and uh, you are working for some <laughs> international organization who are paying you to do that. So they managed they manage to create an atmosphere in which really the lot of percent of population in the post Yugoslavian countries, which were dealing with the war, which have the members war, they really think think that that's the truth. They really believe that the people like us hate their own uh, nation and uh, they are working for some some other interests uh, like German, I don't know, <laughs> English interests, some, something like that. So uh, 25, 27, 20, 28 years after the war, we didn't create uh, nothing about a new atmosphere in, the, in our societies on this way. We had uh, the, the, the uh, court in Hague, in, in Netherlands, we had a uh, the lot of uh, documentation on, online about uh, each specific war crime which happened. We, we, we had a lot of work in media which were uh, writing or I don't know, making documentary movies about what's happening. That's, that's everything free. Everything is easy to reach. You can, you can if, if you want to know some information, you, you, can, you, can, be, you can easily collect that information, but it di didn't help even uh, for a second thing. Uh, for for even for a moment, uh, we we also had the the lot of uh, I don't know symbolic moments uh, between the Croatian presidents, uh, President Ivo Sipović, uh, Serbian President Boris Tadić, uh, ten ten years ago, they were going to the to the to the places which were very uh, to the places of, of big war crimes, and they were saying sorry to each other and. Uh, I don't know even uh, this nationalistic president of Serbia, Alexander Vucic, uh, went to Srebrenica a few years ago. It, it didn't uh, move even a single thing. One reason which it didn't move uh, it is in the situation because the population doesn't have any interest about dealing with the past. Uh, the other reason could be that they just the other side doesn't believe that it's uh, honest, uh, uh, all those symbolic uh, symbolic moments. And the third, and I think the main problem now, uh, 30, almost 30 years after the war, is the next problem. Uh, in population in general, and I live in, in Croatia, I also live in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I, tra I travel a lot in Serbia, Montenegro, and uh, I, actually I, I live like that Yugoslavia still exists. I'm, 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 every month I'm in some other place. And I, I think that, I, and I work in media, I think that I, I can say something in generally. Uh, the main uh, percent of population doesn't have any more interest about those themes and about uh, what happened in war. The, 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 of course, the, the most interest is still in, in unfortunately in Bosnia and Herzegovina because uh, that, that state doesn't get a normal chance of normal living after the war because of that kind of Dayton agreement and the constitutional act and something like that. But in general, especially uh, uh, in the younger population, no one wants to listen anymore about the war. They have their own minds, uh, their own beliefs. Uh, they are mostly nationalistic beliefs or they are just they are not interested in politics and history. So if you start uh, to, to speak to somebody when there are big, uh, big uh, I don't know, big dates, uh, nationalistic dates, and said, oh, we had a problem with that date. Uh, yes, it was a great date for our nation, but we, we made it the same date, some cr war crimes to the others. They don't want to hear you. you, are, you they are boring to hear you. They just they are not ready to hear that anymore. So uh, I don't have the answer, but I must ask uh, people in NGOs, in Heinrich Bell Stiftung, uh, my, myself, all of us uh, in, the, in the public sphere uh, in Yugoslavia, post-Yugoslavia, I must ask myself a question. We must change something. And I don't know the answer, what is that which we must change, but we really must change something because this doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And that's, that's, the, that's the point of my text. So thank you.
Thanks a lot, Raga Markovina, for the inspiring talk. Um, I will give the floor now to Dr. Serja Milosevic. He holds a PhD in history at the University of Belgrade, and uh, recently he has also completed a degree in, at the law school in Belgrade. And since uh, 2022, he is assistant professor at this law school. It's called Union University, uh, uh, a private law school in Belgrade, mm -hmm. where he is teaching now. Um, Serja Milosevic is also the president of an NGO, NGO called Center for Studies of History and Dialogue. And from this NGO, the Center for Studies of History and Dialogue, um, there comes a co-author of the article. This is Alexander uh, Miletic, who uh, is the executive director of the NGO. Please, Sir John. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It was a wonderful day and beautiful evening, but still we decided to discuss very complicated and um, yeah, not so nice topics uh, here this evening. Uh, well, as a historian, I do believe that uh, what French historian Marc, Marc Ferrot once said is true, that history that we were taught as children as, uh, actually shapes our perception of ourselves and of the others. But that history is not necessarily um, mediated only through historical textbooks, history lessons, or um, historical novels, uh, but also through uh, all kinds of social interactions. So it's not only about learning in schools, but it's also about some sort of social learning from family, from uh, politics, from uh, social networks now. So it's not only about history textbooks and the school agenda and curricula, but it is very important to understand that uh, mediating this uh, knowledge about past is not only about uh, giving facts. Uh, now it's in modern times and in this contemporary period, uh, it's also about uh, contesting and uh, trying to deconstruct some very um, uh, uh, some uh, very uh, well some favorite ideas about our past about our role in 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 uh, recent or even more distant past so you have to be an activist as a historian to deconstruct those ideas those basically myths as uh, my colleague uh, Dragan uh, qualified them, they're mostly nationalist. So you have to deconstruct these nationalist narratives about past. And uh, what our textbooks are usually doing, if they are dealing with recent past at all, they just give more or less neutral uh, um, picture or uh, the the. Uh, uh, they present uh, the current of events without qualifying them, actually. But as I said, it's not only about history textbooks. The interpretation in that case comes from, um, from uh, different sources, not necessarily from textbooks. But they are not innocent, also, these textbooks, because usually you see the wording of, of those lessons dedicated to uh, wars of the 1990s, when uh, authors are writing about uh, our side in Serbia, obviously about Serbs, they're using very strong words to qualify uh, crimes that are committed against Serbs. But when they are mentioning the other sides, the, the other victims, then it's always in the context of, you know, it was a war, everybody were doing, you know, bad stuff. So this kind of uh, um, mitigates actually uh, the crimes of our side is something that is that you can find all over the textbooks and again in the public sphere. And not only mitigating, but also uh, in many instances, you can see the glorification of the criminals of war. Yes, you cannot find it in the textbook, but 
if you find in the textbook very simple sentence, all sides did very different, very uh, tough crimes and committed horrible crimes. And in the public sphere, you see the glorification of uh, the perpetrator that belongs to your uh, nation. Then obviously you, you get the impression that what was done by uh, our side was more or less like just revenge for World War II, for uh, even recent uh, 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 the, the, the crimes committed in, in, this, um, in these wars during the 90s. So uh, it's, always, it's always about framing the facts, even if they are neutral, even if they are more or less decently collected and uh, presented, it's just part of the story. You always have this another uh, uh, um, source of interpretation. And that's why my opinion is that a history teacher, especially when tackles these issues, should uh, history teachers have to be uh, um, activists, deconstruct something that is circulating uh, all over the media and social, social sphere. And that's something that we cannot uh, uh, find in, in um, uh, methodology and uh, in how history is taught in, in the region and especially in, in Serbia. So given only neutral facts, it's actually at the end of the day, only strengthening the myths and the narratives that already exist uh, in the society. Um, myself and uh, my uh, organization, we are, <laughs> of course, trying to uh, organize uh, some alternative uh, uh, yeah, uh, program and to offer some alternative approach to what is, uh, what is official approach in, in, in Serbian schools. But again, uh, you can do it only through um, schools and uh, alternative uh, uh, education centers that are organized by NGOs and it's limited in, in, in the range. Uh, it cannot reach uh, entire uh, population of high school or elementary school uh, students. Uh, so uh, my uh, perception and my view is that actually without being uh, supported and without uh, being uh, accepted as a partner by, by the state, uh, uh, Ministry of Education and Government generally, your reach out is very, very narrow. But on the other side, uh, I think that that's the only way for now to uh, intervene in this uh, uh, nationalist uh, uh, narratives that are circulating in, 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 in our region. Uh, because I think myself, I, I learned everything basically uh, in, in those alternative uh, uh, schools and uh, alternative centers for education. And uh, it was a really complicated uh, issue also for myself. And I'm now talking both as a historian and as, as a person who really uh, went through wars and uh, experienced these uh, stuff more or less. Um, not uh, necessarily being involved, but I was very conscious about what is going on. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, yes, the only way through, uh, through this complicated situation now is to continue with those alternative uh, strategies for spreading the, well, the truth about the uh, war of 1990s and to prepare uh, materials, textbooks, alternative uh, manuals uh, and in order to be ready for the moment when government uh, eventual, eventually accepts the partnership of, of um, what is now basically NGO uh, organizations offering uh, alternative uh, uh, curricula. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I do not have lots of good news from, from Serbia. I think that things are getting even worse uh, at the moment. Uh, but uh, 
on the other hand, I see no other way through uh, this situation apart from uh, continuing struggle, uh, which is also complicated with uh, a political context within uh, which uh, those nationalist government governments are actually gaining support from uh, even from the European Union gov uh, organizations and uh, and so on. So it's really complicated to to fight this struggle, but I'm not complaining for something that uh, uh, I actually see as a important. Uh, not mission, but job to do. Um, and as for now, I think that I can stop here. Hopefully, we'll have a chance to discuss those uh, those issues a bit more. Thanks a lot, Sergeant. Um, also for the uh, important last point, um, the mission not to complain because it is. You, you could have all the reasons to complain, but it doesn't help. Um, I will I will um, have one short round of questions to only uh, the panelists, and then I will open the discussion to the floor, to the audience. Uh, I will start with uh, Selma again. Um, as I said, we have positive news uh, because in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the de denial of all crimes established by final verdicts can be legally prosecuted. This is a positive achievement. And you are writing that over 40 cases have been established during the last one and a half year. This is positive as well. However, no single indictment has been filed yet. There's a law, but there are no court verdicts for gen genocide denial or the glorification of war criminals so far, which is, according to your assessment, the main reason to have no verdict yet. Or is it perhaps just the normal duration of such a trial? And if we want to remain pessimistic, um, so we think that 40 cases will not be uh, resulting in any indict indictment, um, we know other non-legal consequences in cases where people have been accused for uh, denial of war crimes in Bosnia and Herzegovina. First of all, to answer that last question, question according to my, I mean, the information that I have, there are no non-legal consequences in the way that, I mean, somebody reacted on something. We have this regular, uh, regulatory agency, you know, in regards to the punishing media for the, uh, you know, use of the hate speech. This is, let's say, it's one part of the story, but as far as I know, this, this is not functioning properly in the way that should. Uh, on the other side, uh, to get back on, on, on that why, uh, what happened actually? Uh, according to the latest information uh, I found on the in the report of uh, uh, Srebrenica Memorial Center, who has been trying to monitor, uh, you know, how much of the of the denial actually happened regarding the uh, genocide denial, but also other other uh, prosecuted uh, crimes. Uh, they stated uh, actually that in the period uh, after the after the the, the, the criminal code uh, amendments were imposed, there was a decrease. But uh, in the last year, according to their information, actually uh, the 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 glorification denial has decreased, unfortunately, uh, not just in the Bosnia and Herzegovina but also in Serbia. Serbia is like. I mean, the leading uh, when it comes to the data regarding that, but why that happened actually, because of the, how to say, very present public discourse that was presented by the media, but also by some of the experts and even the prosecutor's office, that the law is not possible to implement and that there will be no implementation of the law. So basically, at the moment, the perception looks like that. Okay, there is a law, but obviously there is no will by the prosecutorial, you know, office to do on that. And probably, I mean, you know, there are some political influences at some society level for the law not to function. And that's the reason why we organized the event a few weeks ago to check what's going on. Uh, and it's obvious, they, they, they stated to us, yes, I mean, we have the criminal 
complaint and but according to our opinion these are, they are not enough for the raising the indictments and we asked why they are not enough because we had a couple of already uh, prosecuted cases and one case actually before the law was imposed based on the previous criminal code where Ravnogorsky Pokrit, Chetnik Spokrit from Vishakran was actually prosecuted and it was obvious I mean there is a practice there is a, even the practice before the European Court of Human Rights before other courts especially in the Germany here so the the assistance was really generously offered to the state prosecutor's office, you know, even to bring the uh, judicial stuff from the Germany, uh, especially from some specific regions to share with them to, 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 to develop their capacities in order that they are able. So we will see, I mean, we will need to give a couple of, let's say months to them to see what's really going on, but at the same time, we recognize actually that we will go on a field. We will speak with the people in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. We will try to help them, you know, to prepare as much as the better complaints, not me, we as a trial international, but civil society organizations in order to, I mean, to respond to this claiming. Mm -hmm. So basically, I mean, the things are how to say developing. We were carefully uh, follow the situation in upcoming period and we will see if there will be any kind of positive development. And if you give me just one second to refer to something which I believe, which actually tackled me what Dragan said. I mean, I'm at the same state of mind as you, Dragan, because I've been working since 2005 on the dealing with the past. I have seen the progress, but at the same time, I have seen, you know, if we make the step toward, one step toward, they are getting back two steps back. So, I mean, there are the progress, but there are many steps back. And I, and, and me, I mean, my colleagues in the organization, we've been really sitting and uh, discussing I mean, what to do. I know that we are very, very tired. Many of us who are working on the field, we are very tired. First of all, to convince our authorities uh, to, to try to seriously think about what the reconciliation means for them. That is the future of the country. But at the same time, to, to speak with the international community. I mean, why they are repeatedly speaking with our authorities without putting in front of them these important agendas. So I'm getting back on that. I'm not telling that this is the solution. This is far away of the solution because the European accession of the Bosnia and Herzegovina is a, far, far low on the bottom of the civil, uh, I mean, the citizens in the society, we do not believe anymore such a lot in the idea of the EU, unfortunately. But at the same time, I believe that our politicians are still believed because of the investing and the money. That's the only way how they believe in the EU accession. So I found out because we have been communicating with the international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina that there are 14 priorities that Bosnia and Herzegovina committed as the step forward the EU accession, as a step forward the money, I would say. So basically one of the priority is related to the uh, reconciliation. <laughs> they committed to something. <laughs> the fifth priority called, is called uh, reconciliation. We still, still don't know what is behind reconciliation and what they committed to. So basically, I mean, we do not uh, have a lot of knowledge, but I believe, as said, I mean, uh, as you also confirmed that, uh, I mean, minimum of the engagement from the state institutions must be done. Okay, we have the prosecutions. This is not enough. This is not a minimum, but the minimum must be done. So basically I see potential opportunity, I mean, uh, do not get me wrong if I'm dreaming. I'm still dreaming about better Bosnia and Herzegovina. But let's use this and let's, how to say, really seriously recall international community, including, you know, uh, actors in the Germany, that they also need to, when they speak with the authorities in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, they need to speak with them, you know, to, to exactly not you know, to sit with them and to write something and sign the something and that nobody knows what is under the priority fifth, which means reconciliation. State obliged to something, but the state doesn't know, 
the international community doesn't know how we will know and how we will use that if you know if the conversation is going in that way so i will stop here for now and just one sentence mm -hmm. we also in serbia have genocide denial of war crimes denial of legislation and we decided to cover uh Nuremberg trial trials in serbia trials uh, before icc uh, icc but not icty so you can freely deny genocide in Srebrenica and all war uh, crimes committed. And uh, uh, if there is judgment ruled by ICTY. So uh, genocide denial legislation does not cover uh, uh, genocide in Srebrenica and the uh, war of the of the 90s. So you see the cynicism of the of the legislature and of the government. So even God judgment could be uh, covered by the by the law, but not the ICTY. So you can easily deny freely. Um, I asked um, uh, because we were invited to uh, already communicate the moderator and the panelists uh, before, and I asked Dragan Markovina when I was reading his article. Um, when you state that memory activists in the post yugoslav region have failed, what are then the consequences? How do you proceed? And he answered now in his, in his presentation, we need to find other ways to reach the public. Um, and he asked you, and perhaps you have some, some suggestions uh, as an audience, he asked you to, to propose some things, what to do. Um, I, th I think this is a, is a is a huge task and a good chance to discuss later on. Um, I would suggest you to read one article in this uh, perspectives issue, which is an interview with Oli Friedman, who is living in Belgrade as well, and um, she comes from from Israel and uh, is organizing a lot of dealing with the past events and uh, 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 is writing about it as well. And she says, if you don't have a solution, enlarge the context. Um, look beyond your, your, your frameworks, your, your known things, and try to work comparatively, try to connect with other contexts. And maybe this is a, this is a, a, a way out. So uh, I don't have a question to you, Daga. <laughs> Uh, I just have this uh, contemplation now on what you were saying and why. Well, uh, I think that uh, in this generation, we lost the battle. But uh, it's, uh, we must, uh, like Sergeant said, we must uh, give to the next generation some traces of work. Uh, of notebooks of uh, documentary movies of, uh, you know, like uh, work of uh, finding uh, civil victims. And, and we must give them uh, some traces and some uh, knowledge to create a new society, maybe sometimes in, the, I hope, uh, very soon future. So uh, if we are, if we are, uh, we have an uh, idea that this is like I said, Will, it will be much easier to work if we expect uh, that we will change our societies right now. Then we will have a strong disappointment of uh, of nothing is happening. Well, on the other side, if I could be a little optimistic, uh, I must say that uh, during the nineties, that was a it, it was a. And you, you, you can't even imagine of, of uh, the, the state of violence uh, of the state, uh, of the, how big it was to the citizens who are not uh, the same nations and who are not, the, who are not the of the same political nationalistic idea. Yeah. So that kind of uh, violence to the people made uh, create uh, uh, extraordinary fear in the, in the citizens. So now, just last few years, maybe for last five, four or five years, some of the people are started not to be afraid anymore of the nationalistic uh, uh, governments, politics, uh, political leaders, uh, I don't know, nationalistic clerical movements and something like that. So we are 
we are not just now a few years ago the, the societies are start to feel some kind of free freedom of of speaking uh, in generally what they think about anything what happened and what what are the, their idea of the future of the society so i think that uh, it's it's just began and it will be better in but not tomorrow maybe in 10 15 20 years that's that's my most optimistic answer about uh, what are we talking now thank you thanks and uh, last but not least to to serve in one question which is very pragmatic at which age in school do pupils learn about the 1990s and wouldn't it actually with a biased picture taught in school wouldn't it be better to not take a at all. Uh, well, they start uh, learning about uh, uh, wars in, uh, in Yugoslavia in about the 90s, firstly uh, at the age of 13, 14, and then repeatedly at the age of 17, 18, uh, on some, let's say, higher or more serious level in the high school. So in the elementary school, and then again in the high school, because it's repeating curricula, basically, uh, of, of history. Um, I don't think that it would be better not to uh, learn because at least uh, some students, some teachers are attuned to this more subtle and, and, um, and approach that is more faithful to, to truth. So I think uh, it, it, it wouldn't be really way out of this uh, state of mind just to forget about the teaching about the 90s. Um, I think, as I said, it is still very important to have uh, those clubs or uh, centers who, or in which you can organize some alternative um, schooling. Uh, I mean, it's not that dramatic. I, uh, some schools are all, all organized even during the uh, um, school year and the teacher are ready to send their uh, students to those uh, camps in which we discussed the issues of uh, uh, war crimes and uh, uh, gathering uh, students from the region, from Bosnia, from Croatia, from uh, sometimes, sometimes even from Kosovo. So it's, it's not something that is uh, impossible to do. But within the system, it's really complicated. And it's, uh, you can hardly reach the you know, uh, uh, decision makers in order to make them uh, uh, allow you to organize workshop in um, state uh, organizer, state run gymnasium or any other high school. But on the other side, you have people who are willing to cooperate even within the institutions on lower profile. So I think we should not avoid uh, these topics, uh, but continue through various strategies and uh, um, to find a way through that labyrinth uh, and, and um, transfer the knowledge about, uh, about the 90s. That's maybe I still have this uh, uh, enlightenment positivist approach to um, life and uh, education. But I, I really don't think that it would be just a good idea to forget about and uh, just wait for a, a better better conditions. That was not what I meant. <laughs> I just thought that a biased picture to be taught at school would be left out. And mm -hmm. then anyway, if the, uh, the, the um, enlightened way of learning history is anyway taught in third, uh, um, additional circles, then this would be become the first and the, the main source for learning about it. Yeah, but unfortunately, they learn it from media, from uh, political discussions, from uh, the family histories and so on. So they, they, they get acquainted with, with the topic. So I think it's better to leave it even uh, in, in textbooks. Um, at least, at least as a starting point for deconstructing it when we meet them in our uh, alternative uh, schooling uh, yeah. uh, models. So, okay, okay. 
Um, I will allow Usama to ask a question yeah. to Sir Jan. Yes. But then after that, we on need the, to on open. the track very quickly, yeah. but also for, for others. I mean, I was really thinking about that and I support and I really like the alternative ways because at the moment they are like the only right option for everyone. And I recognize as well that the more platforms on, 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 on that way are important, but also what do you think? I was thinking really from my personal perspective about that, okay, we need to sit and talk about what happened, but also I believe it's important that we sit, not as Dragan said, we have been sitting more like with our, the people who have our, the same opinion like we are, how to organize more platforms to sit with the people who have totally different opinion about the legacy of the war, of the reconciliations. Why do are not, they are not ex accepting that? I mean, why they are denying something? Do you think that we have a chance to go into, I mean, I know that we already started a little bit digging into that, but do you believe that we are ready for, I mean, to, 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 to go into the phase of, I mean, confronting on the on the individual level, I mean, us, because we are sure that we are not all thinking about one, one event, one thing on the same way. So I don't know, what do you think? I really, I'm really interested to learn from your position as a historian, somebody who is speaking with the, with the children, with the, with the students. Is this some kind of channel that could work on the, on the more individual level? Um. I, well, I think uh, about confronting with those who are uh, harboring different opinions, it's always a good idea. Uh, but um, when you reach the level in which you have such a horrible state of denial, which is uh, embarrassing uh, even for the victims and for the scholars who are, who, who are dealing with topics, I do not see the point of uh, how can you discuss because at some point it also becomes an issue of not good taste, but really uh, it's it's morally unacceptable. On the other hand, maybe we can learn something from, let's say, American society. They are ready to discuss uh, very openly, uh, even if they are very unpolarized positions. Uh, but again, I. It's, I do not have a simple answer to, to that. Of course, it's always about level of denial. If it is something that, you know, comes from scholarly argumentation, why Srebrenica cannot be qualified as, as genocide? Okay, maybe there are some scholarly uh, acceptable reasons and so on. I do not see them. I do not accept this kind of uh, uh, argument. But okay, you have this person who is that you can recognize compassion towards victims, but puts it on some academic level. And so you, you have really different layers of uh, opponents. It's not all the same. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that majority of those uh, um, are, are not really a uh, uh, good choice to discuss with uh, about these topics. It's better to do that from the a uh, more authoritative uh, position um, as a teacher or um, in some other role, um, but also not uh, uh, um, without uh, allowing different opinions also when you discuss with students. But it's better to have to structure the, 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 the transfer of that knowledge and the, to offer something to, to students, not, not necessarily to uh, those who are already, you know, in a position not to accept anything that comes uh, from those traitors and uh, those who are denying uh, national interests and so forth. So, that's and I apologize. Yeah. No. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the answers. Um, I hope you are still uh, engaged and eager to ask. Yes, please. Hands your right. Um, yeah, do I have to use a microphone or, or I'm just kind of okay? Will all be used okay, the... okay, that's great. Uh, to what Dragan Markovina said, and Annie's question to, to all of you 
actually I understood you that you mean that I mean, these issues of the civil society organizations dealing with the past could not really catch the people. They, they I mean, you, you, you are, they are, you are not related to the, to the citizens and citizens do not understand you. I mean, this is in a way, it, this is a narrative that, uh, or a criticism that applies to uh, all, NGO organizations, uh, at least in the Western Balkans or even, even globally, saying that uh, NGOs are donor driven or they are not related to the ordinary people. Uh, to my uh, experience, these uh, kind of memory oriented NGOs that, that you represent are more related to the ordinary citizens. I mean, you are, uh, in your NGOs, uh, victims are organized people who really, uh, in, in, in some way or, or the, another as victims or as, as uh, people uh, who lived in that time of this uh, perpetrations, uh, they are organized in this kind of NGO. So, I mean, uh, is it, it is it a, uh, an issue that NGOs nowadays have changed? I mean, are they different NGOs than they have been? Uh, are you no more related to the to the victims? Uh, well, this is a question uh, to all of you. Uh, can I answer first because he uh, the the man. Uh, He's talking about something I said. Uh, you are right in the in the way that, of course, NGOs are uh, going doing a great job, and they are connected with the victims. That's not the question. But my question is: What is the point of uh, dealing with the past and reconciliation? It's not the point, in my opinion. It's not the point to be a psychological help to the victims it is okay it, it's good work but uh, the point in uh, of course in my opinion is to create a new atmosphere in the public sphere and in the new society so it doesn't matter if you are connected with the victims and uh, it, it is matter to create uh, something new uh, the war finished 28 years ago and we didn't move even a single thing in a political sphere. The, the, the same percent of people, uh, I don't know, in the Croatia, it's maybe 25-30% in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, also maybe 15-20% uh, in Serbia, maybe even less. 10 15 percent people are aware of what happened and uh, we don't have to speak to them uh, what happened and what uh, should be done that to make a new society but more than 80 percent of people are still vote for the nationalists they just don't want to hear nothing and we didn't uh, create nothing new so that is the problem and we uh, the, the ngos uh, especially in bosnia and herzegovina spend uh, uh, the, the million dollars, euros, or whatever value you want us to speak in reconciliation of the society. And it didn't, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We, we didn't create nothing new. That's my, uh, that's the thing I wanted to say. And of course, it doesn't change the thing that uh, the people from the victim, victim societies uh, felt good when someone uh, from the, I don't know, Europe came to them and tried to collect their stories and uh, that someone speaks with them, it, it's okay. But I, in my opinion, that's, that shouldn't be the point of, of the thing we are doing now. If I may add. Yeah, the, the, the point is exactly, I mean, we have really, I mean, hard work, working civil society activists in Bosnia and Herzegovina that are living, I mean, we are not living on the, we are not all living on the, let's say, project based funded donors' help. We are living that through our, I mean, convincing that we want to change something better. But to come back on the fact, yes, due to the lack of state involvement, engagement, willingness to involve, 
the civil society unfortunately became the service of the state. Many of the civil society organizations took roles of the state from the services that Dragan mentioned, providing psychological support, legal advices, I don't know, even other different kinds of supports that became, how to say, at some point necessary because of the huge amount of the crimes victims needs, not just related to the war, but also to the, I mean, regular socioeconomic uh, life issues. And civil society took those roles, unfortunately, from the states, became the provider of the services that states supposed to do. And that's how, I mean, how that happened that we lost any possible chain, chance that we have uh, uh, institutions engaged. So that's the reason why, I don't know, one of the reasons actually why some of the civil society actually, how to say, are working on a little bit different way. I will not say that they are not engaging, but maybe working on a little bit different way. On the other side, I believe that, I mean, there is a still civil society and activism in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we are not here talking, we are only talking about dealing with the past, but it's obvious if you come to Bosnia and if you are reading, there, there are a civil society, there are activists, and there is a trend of increasing trend of the activists who are actually very loud about many of the things. At the same time, in order to understand the situation, we have the civil society and the activists currently in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially in Republika Srpska in the last couple of years, they really have an issues in, in a practically daily working. The space has been shrinking, you know, and the, the work is how to say very put on the minimum fighting now for the basic, basic rights to work. So, I mean, understanding why is this happening uh, in the civil society and why we are having such a, a little bit different roles that we had at the beginning is, I mean, to understand the situation in general. And of course, there are many of us who are, how to say, trying to survive. And that's the reason why, I mean, we are following different international uh, agendas that are not sometimes, how to say, good for us. But unfortunately, we are not recognizing that, at the, 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 how to say, at the beginning in, in, in the most important ways. Thank you. We can have some more questions. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation, Sam. Uh, I, I really feel with you how they are up and up and downs and success and failure and so on and so forth. So I think going through this phase is absolutely normal, facing all these challenges that are in the region. Uh, one short comment. I think like that it's important also in the moment when you're not able to bring out these new narratives and you don't get support, historically seen, and speaking as a historian myself, it's very important to document and uh, record the voices and recognize the voices and perspectives and the traumas and so on and so forth. So that for the moment when you can go out and present the studies and bring them into the textbooks, uh, they are there. Yeah. So that, that's one encouragement. And But one question is for me, like how do you see the role of the diaspora? Uh, from your communities or ex U diaspora, if you want, like uh, working myself in, in Munich with the ex U diaspora and organizing also discussions in Balkanet and other organizations. It's also connected. Yeah. So that would be interesting to me. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, diaspora from Serbia, uh, I, I, I speak about, uh, about them. It's, they're, they're also very multi layered. You have uh, this diaspora from uh, immediately after the World War II, and they're very nationalist, uh, yeah, mostly pro chetnik you know, if they take stands at all, uh, even in second third generation. Uh, so it's uh, very, uh, yeah, pro nationalist uh, um, diaspora. Then you have this new wave of uh, any Greece who mostly from economic uh, reasons uh, left the country. And they're uh, really, uh, you can differentiate between uh, uh, those who are more leaning more towards liberal ideas, those who are also uh, nationalists, but still 
heading towards west because it's better standard of living and so on. Um, and among those, you can find uh, uh, people who are, you know, in social networks, in private contacts, uh, support what you are doing. Uh, but on some organized level, uh, it still does not exist. So that you have uh, some sort of, uh, apart from moral support, you you can hardly find anything uh, that 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 comes from uh, diaspora as for now. Uh, I do not uh, uh, think that it would change uh, sooner. So basically that's it. They do not get disinterest for what is going on, uh, but I think they're not conscious enough um, to organize themselves. And I'm not talking about, again, giving money, but you know, to make some uh, uh, organizations and then uh, uh, give us type stipend for our students for from the from Serbia who goes to study abroad or something like that not necessarily financing NGOs or whatsoever but somehow organize uh, themselves in order to support the idea in more uh, uh, um, yeah, practical practical way I would add maybe that uh, the uh, academic, the, the academic. Can I say something about that yeah, question, please. please? Yeah. Sorry. Well, yes. Uh, that, that's that's the question which I'm thinking uh, last one or two years a lot. Uh, see, my uh, as you said in the beginning, I was born in Mostar in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, the Mostar is still it 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 is uh, it's actually also an divided city, and it is functioning like it's one city. But in, in the head, heads of a lot of people there, it is still is a divided city by the war line. So uh, the Mostar had a big diaspora uh, of the uh, refugees who, who, who were forced to, to, to went to, to most, mostly to the European, West European countries. So now uh, we had, uh, that's, that's the big question and big, and big problem. There's a big question, a big problem, because uh, those people are having a big trauma uh, from war and from exile, and they are, and they actually create completely new life uh, in Western Europe, Western European countries. So, uh, in some way, they are, they want to help. They want to. They are coming each year. They they have their own apartments, houses, and they are they are coming into the city. <laughs> But they're coming with a state of mind uh, like the war still uh, is not over and they they can't create uh, an, an understanding of the everything what happened last 30 years or 28 after the war i had the same problem because uh, i i was i i was i i had 13 years when i went to live in split in croatia or, and uh, then a few years ago, I said to myself, I must go back to Mostar to, to deal with trauma. So last three years, I, I more than seven, six, seven months in a year, I lived in Mostar. And I, uh, I needed a, more than one or two years to, 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 to face the new, uh, new city and to deal with my personal trauma. So now uh, I think that the diaspora can't understand and they don't want to understand the, the, the new situation and uh, the people who, who stayed to live in Mostar, who lived there before the war and the people from diaspora, even if they are, I don't know, very close family, they are not speaking the same language anymore uh, in the understanding the situation because the, 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 they are living in completely different contexts for the last 30 years and no one uh, had the courage to say that loudly, but that is like that. So I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how can they help in a situation which they don't know anymore. Uh, that's, that's for me. Would you like to add some, maybe just to add, I mean, the role of diaspora, I mean, how, how I see it from the, from the Bosnian society. First of all, unfortunately, I have to say that uh, the role of the, the uh, diaspora in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially uh, by the politician, is, our politicians is perceived through the votes, unfortunately. I mean, diaspora needs Bosnia 
uh, for voting every two years. So basically, you are, as we are, some kind of tool and the weapon in their hands. And you have to understand that. And if you take that from that perspective, you will, I'm sure, <laughs> deeply try to understand the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, actually why you don't want to be the weapon or the tool in the hands of some politicians from the Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, I'm not encouraging you not to vote in the future, but I mean, it's, I mean, one of the questions that you should really pay attention on. On the other side, uh, diaspora is perceived in the last couple of years, which is good. I mean, if we are talking about the EU accession as some kind of driven uh, positive change for the economic investments in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that's the good, that's the good thing. I, 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 as a citizen, I really see, I mean, that the, the diaspora in that regards could play very important role. Uh, first of all, investing in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, investing in the country, I mean, where the, many of the people were born, but at the same time, helping the Bosnia and Herzegovina and helping the current citizens of the Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also, I mean, uh, continuing developing their our work and what they started here. On the other side, perceiving the diaspora from other aspects, especially from the aspects of the, let's say, this dealing with the past process, it's very individual. I mean, and I believe that there is at least individual level of, you know, still dealing with the issue of the dealing with the past diaspora. What's happening to us in trial international is actually that more and more people from diaspora, especially in the I mean, older ages, but also middle ages are getting back to us now, uh, many years after requesting for the justice. I mean, probably because of the many people, you know, sort out the lives here. They even told the children what happened. I mean, so they are now in some new phases requesting really. I mean, we received a few days ago an email. This is not one email. Okay, my mother lost his bro her brother and we really want to, to see the perpetrators punished, or I don't know what's happening. It's also that, the, for example, survivors of the rape and contemplated sexual violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina are becoming, you know, more aware about their rights in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. So they are getting back to Bosnia when they settle down and everything is done in, in order to try to get the rights what they have. On the other side, I mean, I see, I, I still see a group of, it's still small but significant group of the, uh, the younger generation from diaspora who is coming to Bosnia and Herzegovina to uh, first of all track for the roots of the, you know, their uh, families, but at the same time, uh, it's showing an interest, you know, to learn more about dealing with the past and especially some specific areas. I had opportunity a couple of days to sit with one of the really great girls who, who, who this, she's not the one who get back to Bosnia and Herzegovina to spend a couple of years to learn more about the heritage. So basically the relations are existing more on the individual level, uh, but it's still encouraging for me. At the same time, we have this growing, growing trend of the younger generations who are going from Bosnia, but at the same time, I, I still see, I mean, some interest at least from some, you know, younger generations from diaspora uh, to, to involve and to find out and comparing, to be honest, you know, with the students from Bosnia and Herzegovina, younger generations who are studying there and who are probably full of these stories. And I mean, they don't have such, I mean, interest for that. Diaspora students and younger generations are more interested to learn about that than the, the students, according to my opinion, that they will ask me. One more question and in the back as well and there as well. Okay, we have three more questions and then we will just say. I'd like to know if the um, if Russia's war against Ukraine somehow affects your societies. And I mean, Putin also has a total um, historical project. Um, does it work somehow like a mirror or um, what, what do societies do with it? And you even have... 200,000 refugees from Russia. So they probably also stand for different Russia than, than the image serbs have from Russia. 
and cure. Uh -huh. Short answers, please. Because we uh, short, yes, <laughs> lots of have <laughs> very uh, uh, different perspective on on, on Russia, and uh, it's really conflicting situation bet uh, between uh, those positivists, uh, those positive. Uh, uh, image that Russia has obviously in, in, in Serbia as you as you all obviously know uh, and uh, those Serbs who are supporting uh, Russia and Putin uh, they're really puzzled with the, uh, with this uh, wave of uh, Russian emigrees who are completely and you have those comic situations and they learn you know that some certain person new neighbor is a Russian they started to glorify Putin and then they said no 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 <laughs> we just run away from no you, you have but um on the other side I would say that uh this aggression actually uh, uh strengthened and 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 somehow uh, uh they even made even uh more uh, uh aggressive uh, this nationalist uh, agenda and the pro and it's really very difficult now in Serbia in terms of dealing uh, with the 90s and the, the heritage of the 90s in the light of the Ukraine. It's a bit crazy, but we can uh, continue on the discussion later. But uh, it affects uh, it in, in a way that uh, this nationalist uh, agenda and the approach becomes even more violent. Yeah. And, uh, I thought it could be beyond our differences, also be like, like a mirror, um, because it's a total, yeah, it's, both it's ways. Total you can project. Also, you know, now is the moment to support Russia. Okay. So you have both sides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would just say that in a general, I mean, of course, we have been, and unfortunately, we have stayed, I mean, especially after the aggression of the Ukraine, Russia uh, against the Ukraine, we have been over the militarized societies. But I, my opinion is actually that we became more deeply militarized societies after the, the, the aggression. I mean, and th this is how to say obvious in a daily life. These are like very, <laughs> I already tried re re repeats in, in the other countries, what's happening, I don't know, in the Serbia, what's happening in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially in the Republika Srpska, I mean, shrink the space to the people who want to openly talk, who have a different opinion. I mean, do not give them the space to, to, to gather in the public, you know, uh, put the laws that will ban and restrict their, their uh, public uh, opinions. So basically, I mean, there are a lot of influences in this way. And I'm afraid, I mean, that uh, there are still a lot of space for these negative events to continue, not just in Republika Srpska, but also it could happen in other entities mm -hmm. in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. In the back. I have a point to the last question with the diaspora, and it's something a personal question, uh, that people who are born here, raised here, like me, I'm born here, raised here, go to school, study everything, but my parents are from the Balkans. And I think in future, there will be more and more people like me. And is it allowed? To go to votes there because I think I'm just also thinking two three years ago if I had to go to vote there because I'm deciding something where I don't live I'm just three four weeks six weeks in a year there and then I decide for people like who will be the president or something it's like the same thing here I'm paying taxes but I'm not allowed to vote what will where my money will go <laughs> and that's my question if it's should I go to votes because I'm born here, raised here, everything. Yes, I speak at home, not German, but I never lived there for a longer period. And then I go there, okay, I will vote for them, them, because what I learned, it's most of for my parents. They can be like nationalists or liberals or like in my part, it's Yugoslavia was the best. And most of what I learned, 70, 80% is that, and I can read some books or I don't know something, but I think a lot of people vote and vote for people where the parents will also vote. If they are nationalists or not, they don't think about 
Oh, I don't, I don't live there. I go there, nice Croatia seaside, Montenegro seaside, Belgrade, nightlife. Four weeks I'm there and it's fine. And my problem is, should I go to vote? To vote? And what's your opinion like for that? We will take the next two questions as well because we are running short of time and this is not really a question of memory politics. Okay, but no. we, we need to answer it anyway, yeah. but we will do it in combination with uh, some other questions. I had another one, but that is uh, not too much interlinked to yours. I, I wonder uh, that the current protests we see now in Belgrade uh, against um, against violent, violence and probably this goes mostly to so Serbia on this question, would you say they have a potential for a substance? Potential change also regarding um, problematic attitude on the past. Is this also demands between the protests? Another question was there. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of related to the question um, as well, which is I also am born here, I grew up here. And my issue is that I have no chance to inform myself properly about the war. My parents are not speaking at all to me about it. My entire family is completely silent about what happened during the war. So, and I don't find any like good books on educating myself on that. And this is why I don't have an opinion on that because I don't really have a chance to get to an opinion quite easily. Plus, yes, I'm speaking Bosnian, but I'm simply not fluent at reading it because I ne was never taught to read Bosnian. And um, talking about education, educating people in Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia who were actually part of the war, I think it should also be important to kind of educate those um, disparas. I heard the word for the first time today. I just Googled it. <laughs> um, because I'm sure we could influence something in a positive way if we would understand more. And I simply don't feel like understanding enough to go into conversation to support properly without feeling like doing an entire history study. Um, yeah. Um, I think we... Uh, there are two more questions, but we need to answer those first now because we are. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I get this. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll, of course, answer and just a question about uh, voting. And the last question, the surgeon, of course, is uh, is uh, the, the address for question of you, Berle. Uh, see, I had the, the, I'm citizen of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and I, I was very angry of this from of uh, the moment that Croatians from Bosnia and Herzegovina vote uh, in the election in Croatia because they just don't live there. They have the right of their to be the citizens, but they they never lived in Croatia. And I, in my opinion, it's not fair for them to vote in the election in Croatia. Almost all of them do that. Uh, but also, even if I was born in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I lived there for 13 years, and I, I, I lived now in split two hours from my, my city most of Mostar, I never vote in the elections in Bosnia and Herzegovina till the last, uh, uh, last uh, elections, uh, national elections, and last elections in the city of Mostar when I went back to live there. Because it, it, I, I didn't, I was, of course, uh, I know a lot of things about political situation. I had my opinion, but it, it wasn't fair in my head to vote if I will not uh, the fact, uh, to live with the fact uh, with, uh, with, uh, with those people there. Now, when I came back, uh, it's okay for me to vote uh, in the election in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in the election in Croatia because I. I actually lived uh, on the boat address, so that's but that's my uh, private uh, private idea. E everyone can do whatever he he think it's good. And uh, about about last question, there is a lot. Of, I even wrote in my last book. There is a lot of good books, uh, studies, uh, uh, PhDs uh, of the people who are from the the Yugoslavian state and who are young scientists uh, uh, living in uh, Europe, uh, the United States, and everything. But you just have to look for them. A lot there are lots of good works uh, in English, uh, which you can read about uh, the the 90s about the history of uh, of our states. Well. Uh... As for the voting, I don't know. Maybe there has to be some sort of check when you spend, at, say, at least 
three months. Uh, in, in, so kind of uh, uh, a time census that you, you uh, otherwise my answer would be no. Or more practical, it depends on who you, you would vote. So it's more, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately I, I, I cannot, I cannot impose this idea that I, I would really like. <laughs> uh, when it comes to protests in Belgrade, uh, again, um, it's very complicated because I, I, I do not know uh, 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 what is the position of the uh, opponents of the, of the government uh, and how far they're ready to, to go in silencing protests. Are they ready to go to silence it in blood? which I do not guarantee that they won't, you know, uh, if the situation becomes really tough for their uh, uh, staying in power. So I really do not have perspective on how far this regime is ready to go. Um, maybe it's rotten and it could fall easily, you know, but um, the, the main problem with uh, this kind of regime is actually uh, that, that any outcome is actually possible. So that's the that's the, the the level of how abnormal the situation is. Maybe it's really rotten and it will fall in in few weeks or months. And maybe it's very uh, tough and uh, well stabilized and ready to go into violence against citizens. Uh, I cannot guarantee for either of those uh, uh, extreme. Uh, uh, outcomes. So hopefully it will uh, affect the uh, regime in a way that sooner or later we'll get rid of, of, of this progressive uh, party and their uh, uh, decades of their government, but it's just my wishful thinking, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to add information, I mean, this is more on the level of information. I mean, you have a really good, uh, how to say, critically oriented portal called Dealing with the Past, Balkan, where actually you can read uh, the, the, the articles, I guess, including some of the panelists and some of the authors from the perspectives, in English, in Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, in Macedonian, and in Albanian. So basically everything is translated. And besides that, you will find a really, really bunch of, I mean, the reports written also in other languages. So, I mean, to start, and if you really want to start with something very critically oriented, uh, I mean, this is a good suggestion. Just thinking about, about people who are not, who did not go to university, who are not yeah. used to reading PhD thesis, exactly. and so on. And I think this is because you were also asking, we have somehow to get into touch with people on a different way. And from those people who I know, they would not read a PhD thesis. They need something which is easier to get through, which has to kind of yeah, open their minds to, to go this path, to go this way. And this is what I was wondering. And I have the, the impression, like at least in Germany, I can speak for my education here in Germany, we never, talked throughout my entire life in school we never talked about the war in Bosnia and it was just some years ago when I went to school so and this is what I find is kind of weird so I think it's broader than only like what's happening there but also what's happening here and we don't have the awareness and I cannot answer when friends ask, ask me what happened I'm like no clue there was a war <laughs> um we have one, two, three questions, but we take them together and we will stop at nine. So these short questions, short answers. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I'm, I have like uh, one question where I was thinking, okay, there is this kind of uh, uh, um, depression feeling, which is like, uh, like uh, the people are depressed, the, the, all the activists are depressed. Uh, Markovina is also depressed somehow, in, <laughs> like in, in anything. But it's uh, what what uh, what is low, like a progress or what what can happen. So my question was how to make uh, how to make like um, the, the 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 history stories and facts uh, sexy for people to 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 really get in, engage in it. 
like I know the the, the project Crocodile. It was uh, Crocodile. It's it, it's great project, but uh, and this is something we should we are we are working with. I'm also from Balkanet. We are working with uh, also with uh, to 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 bring it here to make it here also a visual and to make it here uh, to, to say the work we can do. But uh, we need to have this kind of organizations also uh, in Serbia or in uh, in Bosnia who are providing us this kind of information and who are uh, able to uh, to work with with diaspora with not this kind of way of thinking. Um, Okay, they are so long there and they don't know what's happening, but to 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 open. And that's my question. It's a question is like how to make this happen and what's happening actually in this in this level, or if something happens. And um, I hear uh, that uh, now in a, a, a memory center or Srebrenica, they did uh, make uh, one uh, a school um, a book for uh, for uh, for young people. And this would be also something we, we could use because here we have also some projects with young people that we are going into schools and talking about uh, uh, war crimes. So this is like uh, how, how to make it, uh, how, to, to have, um, how to have this network and how to use this kind of uh, possibility that we have uh, to, 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 make it, to make it more uh, lively and that people really believe to, uh, to a group of people like, what uh, Professor Kambera, which is now doing in the, for his Sarai work, this kind of thing. So, uh, this is like some somehow my question. I don't know if I, but yeah. Professor Kambera, in, in Saria was organizing a public history festival yeah. every year, and um, and the crocodile is uh, and and there you have an uh, approach to history which is much more through other media than than reading and books. And this is what Crocodile is doing as well, involving much more uh, literary and cultural aspects um, to dealing with the past. So, um, yeah, thank you for yeah, your the comment. People, the people yeah. don't know this as well. Like here, the people you know it now, and we are we are spreading. Yeah, 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 yeah. But how to make it living? As well, how to make it more alive? How to make it more uh, seeable for others to to know this kind of projects and why it doesn't happen? Why it doesn't like? Um, that's my question. Yeah. Yeah. So the networks between the diaspora and the NGOs dealing with the past should be strengthened. I I, I take this as a su su suggestion. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot we cannot take this comment anymore because we have two still and five minutes. Um, the lady in the back was white. Um, you, you um, yeah, I have um, one question to Srećan. Um, you mentioned earlier we should spread something different, some different framing in the historic books. Can you say one or two sentences what uh, should be spread and said out loud? What you really think people should keep in their heads when talking about what happened? One question to you. And Selma, I invite you really to talk to my father, who um, I'm Serbian or German, I don't know, something in between, who has this um, yeah, contrary opinion, what you say, what happened, and, and he's full of things uh, which I'm struggling because I know different, but I don't have exactly, I don't want to accuse him or judge him, I just really would on a scientific way talk to him or understand where this comes from to change this topic. I can't change maybe my, my father's opinion, but maybe the source. And that's something I really invite you if you want to do it. <laughs> um, you are invited. <laughs> Lots of doors open. <laughs> yeah. um, my name is more um, a comment slash suggestion uh, for further discussion afterwards that we have also like a nice um, drink and, 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 and something to eat for afterwards. Um, to what you, you just said, I think um, we were talking about earlier of like uh, international uh, comparison to get inspiration from other countries. And I think, uh, for example, in Germany, we have this um, counselor uh, post uh, to uh, for to help people that have in their families uh, or acquaintances, uh, people that, that um, got a bit, uh, you know, um, like anti-vax uh, movement uh, in Germany and stuff like that to help them 
get back to talk to these people that uh, basically isolated themselves from, from the family. And I think um, a, a similar method could be used also in the discussion of dealing with the past. So like if you have like this um, centers that gives uh, families and, 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 and friends uh, these uh, couple of uh, argumentative uh, helps to start talking about this, this topic. And um, um, but uh, the reason I actually wanted to speak is that I found extremely important what you said earlier about the literacy of uh, the diaspora uh, people that uh, uh, you should not um, underestimate uh, the fact that um, many young people here can speak and understand perfectly the language of, of uh, the origin of, of their parents, but cannot maybe read or, or, or write properly because uh, on one side systemic racism in the countries that they are living and grow, when grow up with and on the other side misconception about uh, multilingualism uh, that were spread uh, in the past until now. So maybe thinking about other uh, ways to communicate these narratives like not only in written words but I don't know podcast videos mm. stuff like that because um, I'm thinking about an example of a, a very good Spanish podcast called uh, the Eso no se habla. So you you can't you don't speak about that. That um, uh, summons um, everyday um, um, aspects of how the Franco regime are is still very present in the Spanish society, and it could be interesting to combine what he was saying about. Um, um, uh, uh, like keeping track of people that uh, lived these experiences and interviewing them. And I don't know, it might be interesting to get together with the Diaspora Association and organization of the civil society there to do something together, because I think it would be very interesting to reach people, especially if you can vote. Um, so then maybe you can vote for the right people. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I will give the word, the last words to the panelists, if you would like to add or summarize or mm -hmm. give us something uh, with us. We will have a drink and, and, and snacks as well, so we can discuss privately further on. Well, I, I will discuss this, uh, I will uh, address this question uh, at the end. Uh, <laughs> I do think that uh, each community has to insist on the crimes and the bad stuff that are committed in the name of that community. So the first point is that in Serbia, they should mostly insist on crimes and bad stuff throughout history done and committed by the Serbs. <laughs> and you know, you see the pattern. And the other point is that we, you always need to have this, at least several examples of mutual understanding, support, help during the war. So uh, I think it's also important to see how people belonging to uh, different sides actually supported each other, helped each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, this kind of uh, experiences and always to have both perspective. It's not all about being, you know, enemies throughout history. Most of the time, at least they live not together, you know, with each other or uh, by each other. So wars are actually very uh, extreme experiences for several years. Most of the time people live or together or one by each other. So those two points insist on our crimes and give positive examples of uh, support and help and all stuff like that, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't plan to conclude <laughs> anything. I mean, uh, would like to continue discussion in a more informal way. Uh, but I mean, just to reflect on what you said, uh, I mean, uh, our mission is not to how to say to primarily, you know, change. We are not going from the position I'm not sure that I'm going to change somebody, especially I'm not sure I'm going to change my father as well, as you cannot change probably your father. But the success for me and for you on the more individual level is actually that we already, how to say, went on the other stage of the communication and the two of us and many of us in this room actually 
are perceiving the things in a different way. And we are those, I mean, of course, our fathers and our older generations are somebody that we cannot probably change how we want to change, but we are those who can make the real change on the, on the really, how to say, individual level among our friends, among, among our, I don't know, tomorrow, our kids, our family members in our community. So basically, I will put that more on the level of uh, that then to talk with our, I don't know, fathers and grandfathers, because I'm not sure, you know, we will succeed a lot. Of course, challenging is a good always putting the facts in front, but do, do not expect in that regard. Uh, and I believe actually what you said is one of uh, the good options that we could use. And I know a lot of, a lot of things uh, uh, through the storytelling that helped people Maybe not on this, I mean, level of the, how to say the authorities and the politics, uh, official politics, but more on the level of, of the individual level, you know, how we can recognize each other suffering and how we can maybe a little bit more understand, you know, what's happening in, in ourselves, but also in our family. So I strongly support, I mean, <laughs> that kind of visions and especially in regard to, you know, making some more, I don't know, connections with the Aspera because these are like really good goals. Well, I can say just one sentence. Uh, the, the, my main idea, uh, which I speak, speak about uh, uh, dealing with the past uh, in Mostar is next. And a lot of people doesn't like to hear what I say. But uh, uh, my uh, uh, suggestion is to make the uh, city museum of history in which uh, you will have the, the department of Croatian vision of history of Mostar, Bosniak vision of, of history of Mostar, Serbian vision of history of Mostar, and some kind of Yugoslavian vision of history. And you will have four completely different culture memory in the same museum as you had it in uh, real life and then everyone can go inside uh, and get, and can hear the completely different stories about recent history and about history of the 20th century and history of last few centuries and then at least it will uh, create a, a, a state of mind that we still live together, that we don't have the same way, uh, we don't look the, at the same way on the history, but that we should still live together in future. And that, that is at least we, we can do. In my opinion, that's the only solution of uh, the things will go better to create an understanding that they are living together and we, that we don't see the history on the same way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, we found some solutions. We are having a, a positive feeling after a discussion dealing with the past in the Balkans or in the Western Balkans, which is actually uh, post-Yugoslavia here. Thanks a lot. Let's have a drink. <laughs>